Let me introduce my three colleagues who will be giving the presentations today, starting at the far end of the table. We have Shadi Ashnai, Yusung Chang, and Brett Champion. Shadi, let's just get right into it. Let's start with you. A bunch of new features inside image processing and signal processing. Yes, thanks, Zach. So I'm going to talk about image and signal processing features in version 9. Image processing was new in version 7, but a lot was added over the past two versions as well. 9 is going to have a lot of new features. And, and um, at the end, I'm going to talk about the signal processing features that were new as well in version 9. Let's get started with image processing. A lot of new things got added in version 9, including some interactivity that, gets, um, uh, that makes the whole image processing as, uh, solutions a lot easier to get done. 3D images are new in version 9 as far as rendering, processing, and creation of data, out of core processing of 2D and 3D images, and a lot of enhancements in different areas of uh, image processing, including filtering, feature detection, color management, and so forth. Let's get started by getting an image into our mathematical session. I'm going to take this image out of the slideshow mode so that I can show all of the interactivities. As you can see, once the image is selected, I have a toolbar attached to it in version 9. The first tab allows me to do a lot of different types of selections, including rectangular, circular, or freeform. And, and once I do the selection, I can, for example, copy them as a list of images and paste them into a session. The other tab that we have and is very commonly used is the crop tool. I can crop the region of interest from the image that was just imported, hit crop, and I get the cropped version. There are a lot of transformations introduced in this um, image assistant toolbar, including um, flipping from right to left or top to bottom, Resizing based on the percentage or the actual pixel size, while also keeping, for example, the aspect ratio to resize. Um, getting access to a lot of information about the image, including dimensions, color, space, and so forth. And we also have the option of changing um, some of the properties of the images, including color, space, interleaving, and some others. We also have access to a bunch of image processing filters and functions under the More section. For example, I can go under image effects and use the embossing effect, get a preview of what I'm getting after applying that filter, and once I apply, the image is being embedded, um, the filtered image will, will get replaced. Note that this is all being happening on the image, and that image could be inside of a bunch of code, and that gives us a lot of capabilities for uh, pre-processing the image in order to get the better result out. Let's get the image back again. If I scroll down, you can see that underneath the image, there are a bunch of predictions um, proposed as the next step. For example, I can go ahead and click the flip button down there, detect some edges using either of the methods that are available and changing the parameters to the edge detection function. Hit apply. As the next step, maybe invert the colors, do some blurring using a bigger radius, and maybe do auto adjustment. Once I'm happy with the result that I've got, I can roll up all the processes and get the final result. You can see that all of these interactions are giving me ways of processing the image ahead of time before getting to the actual process um, for solving a problem, or perhaps um, just have fun to explore um, what are the other capabilities, for example, getting to the histogram of this image, and then changing the axes, frames, image size, background, and so forth. So a lot of fun interactive uh, versions of image processing are added. Let's get to the 3D images. Of course, one of the biggest features that were added in version 9. Here I'm importing a CT of an engine that was created. This is included in the example data set. And as you can see, the CT image is, uh, has created a 3D volume that can be rotated, flipped, zoomed in and out, and, and be explored. I also can create a 3D image from a numeric data set. Here I'm creating a 3D Gaussian matrix, a 41 cube data set, and I can create a 3D image out of that. For example, this can be used for exploring some, um, some data creation or manipulation. Here I have the game of life in 2D, 
I can change the seed to get to a different initial state, and then I can see different generation, multiple generations of the game of life happening and visualize it as a 3D volume. I can also create an RGB volume from a set of RGB images and look at it and render it. There are a lot of rendering options available for 3D images. Color function is the option that allows for changing the color function, also known as the transfer function. Here I'm using a rainbow opacity, which is basically assigning a rainbow color to all the pixels and assigning a linear opacity to the values of the, um, of the volume. So basically all the pixels that are black and represent the background are fully transparent and all the other pixels um, have linear opacity based on their values. I can also specify a custom color function. Here I'm using a blend between four colors based on the, um, again, intensity values of the pixels, and I get a different rendering. We also have provided an, a palette for um, changing the color function, which is accessible through the right-click menu on the image 3D. Once you're there, you can either choose some of the predefined opacity and color functions from the menu, or you can manipulate by moving the, um, the nodes of the color function or even assigning colors um, to the nodes by double-clicking on that. Background is another um, rendering option that is very commonly used, especially with, with some special color functions like the X-ray, uh, where most of the values are bright and a white background does not show much of the volume. Box option is also very useful since most of the... Um, most of the acquired data set do not have the exact same resolution in all three dimensions. Typically in Z dimension, you get a different resolution um, and, it's, um, and, and it's typically not as dense. Uh, for example, in this case, you can see that the head does not show up in uh, correct proportions of the actual head. And I can set the box ratio so that the, uh, the volume is rendered in the actual size of the object. It's very common to explore um, the image 3D or the volumes in order to see inside of the volume. There are two common ways in Mathematica 9 to explore a volume. One being clip range, specifying the clip range option that clips away part of the volume. Here, for example, I say all of the X and Ys in the XY plane have to be clipped and I can change the Z clip range so that I can um, basically see uh, all the volume in one, one dimension. The other common way to explore inside of the vo volume is to see projections of it in different dimensions. Um, here I'm changing, again, the slices that are visible in three different dimensions and highlighting where, where I am in each dimension. Similar to 2D images, you can access different properties of image 3D volume, uh, volumes give, um, using image type, image dimensions, compute the histogram, or even do some measurements like compute the mean intensity values or the standard deviation of values. Uh, most of the filters and functions also support image 3D. You can do the same gradient filter that was available for 2D images using a radius 2. So here we are computing the gradient based on a 5 by 5 by 5 local, local neighborhood. You can also pass the same processing functions to manipulate and do, for example, erosion of the engine that we had earlier. A lot of these um, images can be find, uh, found in different fields like um, basically medical sciences and biology, material sciences, geophysics and environmental sciences, and so forth. Let's move on to the next topic, out-of-core image processing. With the introduction of image 3D, and with the existence of a lot of large images, um, it's very important to be able to do out-of-core processing of images. Basically, in this scenario, uh, chunks of the image are, are imported into the memory, processed, put back to the, um, to the disk, so that very large images can be processed. Here I'm getting a not very large image for the sake of the presentation, but I'm showing that um, how, these, how, how all of these functions are working with this uh, file that is, exists in this path in my machine. We have introduced three basic functions to do out-of-core processing. First of them is the image file scan. Uh, this function basically works by side effects. I have a total variable and I want to compute the total intensities of this uh, image by accumulating all of the intensity values. I can do image file apply, which is basically the same as image apply for in-core. 
And um, it's giving me a file, a, a path to the file that was written um, after all the computation was done. So let's import this and see that the inversion, basically one minus, one minus hash, was done on this image. We can also do local filtering out of core via our image file filter. And again, if I import the created file, you can see that the maximum filtering has been done out of core. There are also a lot of new features added to different areas of image processing. Enhanced color management is one of them. If I import this cone flower and get the options color space, you can see that an object color profile data is, um, is sitting there. So basically, this is the ICC profile that has come with the JPEG file. And this profile can be used for converting the color space of the imported image to any other color space, including the three new CIE color spaces that we have added in version 9. Feature detection is another um, nice feature that we have added. Here I'm doing a face detection, finding all the faces bigger than 100 uh, pixels. And I'm highlighting the rectangles showing the faces in the image. We also have feature tracking added into, a, into version 9. Here I have a list of images. I track all the features in the images that were specified. And I highlight the, um, the found points in each frame um, so that you can see the track points and the track points and then do a list animate to show the tracking. Here you can see the result. It's um, definitely important to mention that this highlight image, um, along with a lot of other utility functions, were added into version 9 that I'm not going to show in this talk, but I definitely encourage you to look at them in, in our guide, uh, guide pages. Here I'm also going to show a segmentation based on local texture using the new in 9 Gobber filter. I'm creating a um, Gobber magnitude filter based on the Gobber filter. Here I'm doing Gobber filtering along two, two directions, 45 and four, minus 45 degrees. And you can see that the texture is um, highlighted, either the um, stripes that are along 45 degrees or minus 45 degrees are highlighted in the filter. And if I compose a binary version of the two filtered images, you can see that the, um, that the image was segmented based on the local texture. Let's move on to signal processing. There are a lot of visualization and analysis of signals added. We have added capabilities for filtering and processing of signals, including audio images and other data. There is also capabilities for designing digital and analog filters. Let's import a sound file here in Mathematica and compute the spectrogram of it. We can also compute the periodogram using different window lengths. Periodograms can be also computed and visualized for images. Here I have a half-toned image of a face. And in the periodogram, you can see high frequencies as well as low frequencies features of the image. Image periodogram can also be applied to 3D images, like this MR image of the knee. And in order to see the inside of this 3D periodogram, Let's use a clip range that clips out parts of this volume. As far as filtering goes, we have added, um, again, a, a complete set of new filters that work with frequencies. Low-pass filter is one of them. Here I'm specifying the cutoff frequency for filtering that noisy signal that I just created. And you see as I increase the um, cutoff frequency, the signal is smoother. I can also run the same low-pass filter on the halftone image from the previous slide. And if I assemble the before and after, you can see that all the low-frequency fe features are preserved and all the high-frequency ones were removed. We have a full support of designing filters in version 9, FIR, IIR, and analog filters. Let's get started with FIR filter design. Um, there are three classical methods for directly um, creating FIR filters, including least squares, frequency sampling, and equal method. 
let's take the least squares method that tries to design the filter by minimizing the mean squared error between the ideal spec, being low-pass filtering, all the um, frequencies below 0.8, and uh, filtering everything else. Here is the magnitude response of the filter that was just created with the uh, least squares filter kernel, the, the blue uh, plot, and the ideal uh, filter specification, the red plot. The area that was shown in this graph is what is mi being minimized with the least squares filter kernel. This filter can be applied to, again, signals. Here I'm getting one row of this image and then filtering it using, using the H filter that I created using list convolve. Or it can be passed to image convolve as a 2D kernel and used for filtering an image. Least squares method is also known as the window-based method. Um, here I'm using a hand window. I'm creating a hand window, and I'm multiplying it by the created filter to apply a smoothing effect to the filter. If I look at the magnitude response of the ideal speci filter specification, the originally designed filter and the smoothed version, you can see that this red plot, which is the smoothed one, uh, is even diminishing the mean squared error more. You can choose from different um, from a, a diff um, different window sets. We are, we already um, basically support about 25 windows in Mathematica 9, uh, based on the desired attenuation of the filters. Here I'm showing you um, four of the windows uh, that that are supported in version 9. They are um, digital filters can also be designed by transforming an analog prototype. Um, to its di digital equivalent using the bilinear transformation. Here I'm creating a Butterworth filter, an analog filter, and I'm using two discrete time model to, to convert that to, the, to a digital filter. Let's take a look at the impulse response of this IAR filter and use it again to filter the row of the image um, that we extracted in the previous slide or use it for filtering the whole image. As mentioned in the previous slide, we have analog filters. Butterworth, um, Chebyshev type 1 and 2, elliptic and Bessel filters are the ones that are supported in, in Mathematica 9. Here I can, uh, I can create different filters of different orders, and I'm showing you the transfer function of those. One can take a look at the body plot of either of these um, analog filters that were created extract the poles of the Butterworth filter or any other one, even visualize the poles, or look at the response of the analog filter to different uh, inputs, including like in this manipulate triangular or, uh, or square wave um, with uh, different periods. Um, this was basically my talk for image and signal processing in uh, version 9. Hope this actually gives you a good introduction to the new features in version 9. Um, and feel free to explore all of our documentation and new features in Mathematica 9. So I had a couple follow-up questions for you. Uh, first off, uh, do we support stereo sound in our functions? Um, yes. Actually, let me show you. An example data sound data set that we have. Let's take a look at the full set. There are a lot of sound examples um, in the sound um, example data set. Uh, there are a couple of um, stereo sounds. I think um, the rolling coin, if I extract the channels, or actually channels, um, you can see that this has two channels. And then I can compute, if I import the sampled sound list, typo, and then compute, for example, the spectrogram of the imported sampled sound list. It's accumulating the sound of two channels and, and giving us the spectrogram. I can also do the periodogram of the imported sound, and you can see in this case, two plots are provided, um, are computed for the two channels that were imported. I should perhaps use <coughs> A window size in that case, let's say a thousand samples, and see a smoothed version. Very nice. 
Uh, one more question before we move on. Uh, yep. Do all image processing functions support image 3D? Um, documentation for individual functions, of course, say whether or not they support image 3D. Not all of them support image 3D. Um, first reason, um, so many of the image, uh, image processing functions um, do not even, uh, are not even well defined for uh, 3D. Um, and um, just, just because version 9 had to c come out eventually anyways, uh, we didn't have time to add support to all of our functions, but the ones that do make sense for 3D are definitely going to be supported in future versions. All right. Well, if you need to find some sample code or some examples about image processing or signal processing, head over to the Documentation Center. You can also learn more at wolfram.com slash Mathematica. Yu Sung, you'll be up next here, and uh, another new feature inside Mathematica 9, a very exciting new feature, sure. was R-Link. Right. Okay, so I will talk about this R-Link and integration with R within Mathematica using R-Link. So let's take a quick look what we are talking about here. It's just a very simple example to give you a taste of what we are talking about. So first of all, when you try to use the R with the Mathematica, what you should start, first start with is need the R-Link or, you know, the... Uh, more experienced users would know, you know, you can do the, uh, this. Oh, of course, you already did it. So after doing that, the first step is to install R link, install R. So what it is, it does is that if you don't have a R installed on your machine, it automatically grabs it and installs it for you. But in my case, it's already in there. So let's say I define some just a range one to 10 variable to the A. And the R set is a simple function assigning this particular the variable A into the uh, AA, in, in, in this case AA, in, in R. So, you know, what essentially it does is they send the data of the A to the R. So now the, the R knows the definition of that AA. Now, let's try also single just line evaluate, just like when we are, you're typing the lines in the, uh, the R. So R evaluate a command for that. So you can say BB assigning 1 to 10. It's a similar to mathematical range command. And you are getting the uh, answer back to the Mathematica automatically. And now, since I send the AA to the R already, I will try the type of AA. And it will answer one of those you know, defined types in R, in this case, integer. And then, well, I want to see the value, you know, value of R. Then you can evaluate that string. Now, also, you can use your own function in R. In this case, I already define function x, which doesn't do anything except the securing the uh, variable. And then, good thing about this R link is it's completely integrated with Mathematica. So you can use R function as if it's a Mathematica function. You don't have to any conversion and things. So see, you can just feed it too, and you get number four. And you will notice that it's uh, returning as a double because the default type for the, you know, the R is the not integer type. And then you, you can assign the A. In this case, it's actually sending the mathematical variable A to the R. Then it gets to, to the des this defined function, and you get the answer for that. Also, you can directly use the uh, AA that's already in R using the R evaluate, and it gets that variable from there, and then evaluate it. So this is a very quick example, and I will you know go deeper later. But I will quick start with this. So what does the R link do? First of all, I'm sorry, I didn't mention what R is. So, you know, I, I hope that most people, you know, the, are interested in this R already knows what R is. R is a uh, open source the, uh, language for the statistics. It's, it got very popular since 90 to 25, uh, I mean, 2005. And, you know, it, it, it said a lot of activity around that language R. A good thing about R is it's a very community driven, you know, language. And they, they have uh, like a 400, more than 400 the packages around all these areas. So, the, what R link gives you is the exchange data between R and Mathematica. It's comp uh, as you can see, I, I, as as you I, I demonstrated, it's very fluid. You know, the uh, it's very seamless within the Mathematica. Also, another thing is the R provide a very specific code uh, to do some very application oriented the uh, statistic functions. If you found those, or you are, you're already in you know R programmer and you have a some bunch of R code, you can execute those R code within the Mathematica without, you know, very seamlessly. And another one is the, uh, this is more bigger one than uh, everything else. So what, what this R link eventually gives you is the ability to combine the workflow in the R and the workflow in the Mathematica within in a single workflow so that you can get a benefit from both of the command, I mean, both of the word. Let's see, so why R link? Why, would we, why do we care about this R link? So the, uh, it, probably a lot of people here are already familiar with the math link and J link, all these link 
linkage technology from the uh, Mathematica. So this is a lady stage to the Mathematica's connectivity technology. So it, it follows this our framework, how we handle the uh, external languages within Mathematica. What it gives you is full access to R functionality within Mathematica, especially given the fact that R is evolving around the community and it has a lot of application specific functions, especially in biotechnology or finance, you may be able to find some of the functionality very, you know, the uh, specialized function that you might not be able to find in Mathematica. You can just grab that and use it without any, you know, problem. And another thing that the, uh, the Mathematica provide here is the you can use Mathematica as actually a, a very powerful development and testing and also visualization and eventually deployment environment for R. It's slightly different from, from the uh, just a regular you know integrated development environment such as I believe R in case of R uh, they have a R Studio. It's slightly different because uh, Mathematica not only provides just uh, you know plain text editor type of environment, but also it, it provides a lot of different functionality. That's what my, my fifth point. So not only you can just use the R statistic functions, you can also you know, utilize the Mathematica's built-in functions like manipulate, dynamics, and all these thousands of functions across the old area, for instance, image processing that we just show. And also you can combine Mathematica's high performance, highly optimized symbolic numeric functions, such as like if we talk about like a linear solve, R pro has its own linear solve, but the community version, the open source version, doesn't contain highly optimized the uh, you know the uh, library for that. And for that purpose, you can actually use Mathematica and use the Mathematica's power. And if you find some other functionality in R, you can just send that data back to R and process it and get it back. Now. Uh, the last, you know, the point of this is that the, uh, you know, if you're a traditional R user and you are interested in Mathematica, definitely it's a great tool to uh, make a transition from the R to the Mathematica. So let's let's take a look at how you know the the R link works in detail. Uh, as I said, we start with the uh, need the uh, downloading the package, the R link, and then the first thing you want to do is install R. So it, it does a two things. If you don't have already R installed in on your machine, it grabs it automatically from Wolframe's the uh, data packlet server. So that means it guarantees you you're getting uh, you know the uh, the certified version that will, that's compatible with the R link. And when you do that first time, what you are seeing is this you know quick pop up saying you're chosen to install you know R R link and it is. You know, commands the download, and it takes that that long time. The R whole the the uh, package is not that big. Once you're done with the installation, of course, I already installed it. You can check the version of the R using the uh, this is R command. So R dot version, then it tells you a bunch of information about the current installation. For instance, the uh, if you want to just take a look at version number, then you can just uh, you know. Put the property version, then you see the R version two point one one four point zero. That's what got installed here. So also, if you, in, you know, for some reason the uh, R installation doesn't, you know, go on or it didn't succeed, and then you can manually try to install it using this R link resource install. Of course, you know, in this case we already have it, so it just tells you that it's already being installed. And then if you, uh, this one is kind of a dangerous command. I'm not going to evaluate it, but this essentially what it does is it's uninstalling. The thing, the uh, R packages that Mathematica downloaded and stored in is, it's the uh, system directory. Now, uninstall R just means it doesn't do uninstalling of the whole package. What it does is it's unloading the uh, current R session, the client, so that when when you did that, do that, what's happening is if you have any variable that's stored in R side, it's gonna be uh, deleted and you you can st start freshly using install R again. So that's what's, what it's happening. Now, th there's a question about, oh, well, I'm already using R, and I just want to utilize the R installation that I already have. The answer for Windows, we do have an answer. So you know, you, you have a command install R, and the, the, uh, there's an option value. The R home location goes to the uh, you know, particular location that your distribution is being installed there. Make mm -hmm. sure that your R distribution include the uh, shared library there so that the Mathematica can load that one. Uh, I will, the, there is a solution for the Linux and the Mac too, but we will discuss that in Q&A. Now, let's just start with a very basic step. So how are we going to exchange the data between R and Mathematica? So first thing you have to know here is that 
Uh, Mathematica has a lot of different types, but you know, unified as an expression, right? So the R doesn't have a, that, you know, the wide range of data, you know, the, uh, the representation. So there, there is a little bit of a compromise. There's things that you can send to the R, and there's some things that you can't. Let's just start with, the, uh, again, the same command. So the first step, R set is a command that I'm sending the any expression. It could be a number or just a regular expression, whatever. They're sending it to the uh, R and assigning that to the AA. It, it is actually equivalent to the uh, evaluate AA assigning 10. So, of course, it's just like different in this case because uh, in mathematical case, it automatically type cast to the integer. In our case, it doesn't do that. So let's see I did this and see the type, then it says integer, right? Also, it's not just the only numbers. I can assign a list of the numbers like this, so a list. If I see the content of the a list in the R side, now it's having the uh, list of a number from 1 to 10. Now, you can receive the uh, data from the R2, just like what I did. So when you just type the AA, you're getting the 10 back. A list, you're getting this number back. And the fascinating th thing here about he it here is that you don't have to do any conversion process. Mathematica knows what type it is getting, and it actually put into the form that it's understandable in the Mathematica, other Mathematica functions, so you can just directly use it. Now, another one is the uh, you can also assign the variable and get the variable directly to the Mathematica. So the difference here is this. So if you just do this, let's say without assigning, you just evaluate. What's happening here is you're getting the number back to the Mathematica, but that particular list of one, one to three is not being stored in R. So only way to access it from the Mathematica. Whereas if you assign it and get it, then you're having the number in both ways. So you have a B list defined in R side. Also, you have this list of numbers defined in the Mathematica side. There, you could assign the different things too. For instance, the uh, matrices, you know, the uh, in this case, uh, Mathematica's Gaussian matrix one, which probably is three by three matrix, I'm assigning that to the Gauss. Now, what I'm gonna try, what, what I can do is just like a R's assign command, you can partially assign. In this case, first column, I want to uh, first row, I want to change it to the zero zero zero. So that's what's happening, and I see the contents of it again. Then, as you can see, it, it's partially assigned in the uh, first row. So let's move on to the slightly, you know advanced topic. So what kind of data type is being supported in this R link? So first, the things that I already showed you, the, back, the list type and matrix type of numbers, integer and doubles. And um, for, I mean, of course, it's just machine precision numbers, unlike the Mathematica. R doesn't support the arbitrary precision, so you, you are, you know, the uh, limit to the uh, using the machine precision numbers. Also, the uh, notion of the list, it's just a flat list, you know, mass, the, uh, in our the world, they call it the vectors and the matrices are supported. Also, you can assign the ragged list, just like this one, so it has a just varied lengths, one to five, and you can just assign into the particular variable. Also, there's a different the uh, native types that uh, the types that's native to native to R. One is a string type in R that's called the characters. So, I'm assigning the a list of characters here. So I'm using string split. I'm assigning that and check out that variable that's being assigned to the uh, that particular characters. Then it, that's this is a list of characters. Also, the Boolean values in Mathematica side, which is also called in logical values in the R side. So you can just assign the true and false values. In this case, random choice of true and false. And it says it's a logical value. And you can do a combination of any of these. So, you know, this variable combi contains all these different type numbers, variables, and, you know, these strings. Now, actually, there's an interesting thing about uh, when you're, it comes to the assigning is that R support the attribute, attribute to the, uh, this data structure. And in the, future, in the later on, I will talk about this more, you know, the expanded version of it, uh, something called data frame. And then uh, you can easily assign this attribute to the, uh, the uh, each, each object using the R object and R attribute command here, just like that. So instead of just setting the variable obj in R side with the range of number zero to the uh, one to nine, what I'm doing here is it's a R object, and I will describe what this R object and R attribute mean in the later on, and assigning the one of the uh, attribute of the uh, R object, which can be a dimensions as a three by three. So let's see how, what's happening here. So this is a return form of that R object in Mathematica side, 
And if, if I evaluate that OBJ in R side, what you're getting is the uh, matrix out of this, you know, is the uh, number nine. And as you, you notice, the uh, matrix notion is slightly different. You know, this is kind of a transposed to the uh, what Bell's Medica do. Now, let's move on to the, uh, so we know now know how we can exchange data between R and, you know, the uh, Bell's Medica. Now, how we can call the R's code or R functions from the mathematical side? The, there's a simple example here. So already I showed this, this command R evaluate, which shows the numbers like this. So essentially what it does is it's just like you're typing this particular string in the R command, you know, the R console, and you get the answer. Of course, you can use the, uh, you know, various, this, you know, the uh, statistic functionality that I already have. So in this case, I'm getting a mean of this list of the number one to 10. And also I can, in this case, uh, I'm, I'm getting a uniform, 20 uniform distributed numbers ranging from zero to 10. And you get these numbers. Now, this here is the one thing that I mentioned before. If you just evaluate like this, the output result is just ascending to the Mathematica and R, the running R the behind the scene doesn't know about this value anymore when, when, when it returns the, the, the output to the Mathematica. So what, what I mean is that if you evaluate the uniform, which is uh, actually the Mathematica variable here, R doesn't know about it because it's not R's notion. Now, to avoid that, when you, you want to keep, if you want to keep the copy of the variable in, in between both the uh, Mathematica and R, what you can do is you're assigning it here like this, and also doubly assigning it here in the outside, so that the variables are living in both in the R and Mathematica too. Now, you can also do the multi-line evaluations pretty easily. Only thing you have to remember is wrap things around with those, these curly brackets and just uh, you know, using those line breaks to the, uh, make the multi-lines. In this case, assigning variable A to 1 to 10, B to 10 to 15, and 13 to 15, create a list of essentially joining these all three, the, uh, three lists and getting a sum of it. And as you can see, you can the, uh, you know, get the answer. And you know, one of the, the, the points that I made at the beginning, why you were care about our link is that the Mathematica can be used the uh, very good verification and testing tool to the, uh, for the R because a lot of Mathematica functions are written very mathematically correctly using symbolic computation. So in this case, you can easily check that it's exactly the same thing that doing in Mathematica. So you can com confirm that answers are exactly the same. Now, uh, I mean, the real fun thing here is you can build up your own functions in R and just grab it and use it in Mathematica as if it's a Mathematica function. So in this case, I'm gonna assign a function. So uh, why don't I start with the, uh, okay, let's start with that. So in our side, I'm defining fun as a function, which only, only thing it does is just carrying the number and getting that pointer to that function to the assigning and that assigning that to the F. And what's get, the F gets is the R function, the closest notion, the object notion in R. So what F has is it, it contains a pointer to the function that is defined in R. Now, how are you going to utilize that function? Well, this is the, just a kind of a dumb way to do it. So you just, you know, use it within the R like this. But it's not that exciting. So what we want to do really here is using this as if it's a mathematical function. So uh, let's again say assign an F, but instead of assigning fun with the, uh, you know, in R side, I'm not going to assign that. Now what's happening is that the pointer to that particular function, the reference to the function is associated with that F in mathematical side. And you can just call this f with the uh, any mathematical expression, and R will do if there's a conversion variable, you know, the valid conversion, it will do whatever computation it's supposed to do. So in this case, you can just pass the uh, list of 30. Or another way to referring this, you know, the particular function is using R evaluate this fun because if you do this, because I already assigned this function in on top of the line 52, what you're getting is a returning form of the reference to the, this R function. So you can do this and using that particular argument to that function too. Now, this is not preferable way for us because uh, you know, it, could be, it, it could bring some confusion between the object and the function, the point reference. So the preferable way to do it is using R function command and uh, calling the function. What, what's happening is instead of you know, this uh, you know, returning, getting back and returning back, it's actually just directly going to the function reference to the R and pass this variable to it. And again, you can combine this with any other method fun you know, mathematical functions. For instance, you can do uh, you know, the uh, square of the Gaussian matrix using just this. Now, and I'm, I'm 
trying to confirm that whether it is actually the same as what you are doing in the mathematical side, and of course the answer is true. So you know, I can do this and take a look at it. And of course you can utilize this to visualize this within the mathematical, just like that. So as you can see, it's a very seamless. And I mean, if you're familiar with the CUDA link and the OpenCL Open Open link and other linkage technology we brought up last year, I mean, the in, with the version 8, it's quite similar frame and it's pretty easy to use. Now, I will go over some interesting examples. So in this case, just using the uh, R zone function to process a text. And in this case, using the split function to essentially a, uh, so I create a split function and use that function as if it's a mathematical fun function and pass it with the uh, text. And what you're getting is our object with the uh, frequency, I mean the location of the each word and the uh, attribute as a names. And uh, so it means the end is happening in 25th place and such and so forth. Now this is not that exciting example, but we will move on to the more complex examples from here. Now, as you see, Notice here we have a bunch of these, you know, R code, R function, or some R object that represent the the object from the R within Mathematica. It, it's because you know, the, as I mentioned, that the R and the uh, Mathematica has a slight difference between how they represent objects. So this is over, you know, schematics how we are converting this R object with them, our own. So uh, for instance, the uh, characters logical, complex, double, and integers that's native R formats, and that's getting into feed. Uh, so when you call the, for instance, the list of the vector, like the integer li list of integers, that's get as a R vector with the native type integers, and that's feed into the Mathematica and we can communicate back and forth. So to confirm what kind of representation you have, it's actually technical details that you don't have to worry about most of the time. So as I said, integer values in, in presentation in Mathematica size looks like this, but when actually Mathematica gets it, it already converted to the form that Mathematica other functions can understand, just like a plain list of integers. Let's get over like a three examples, more exciting examples, and uh, uh, stop this. You know, talk about R. So, one one thing about unique thing about R is they they provide something called data frame. So, a data frame is con uh, it consists of the not only data but also multiple data and the meta information about that data, like you know the uh, column, row, what kind of information they want to have on the data, and using those information they can easily filter out the object from you know using. That, that, that particular field. So in this case, what I'm trying to do is assigning a numbers range from 18 to 23 and list of heights and the list of names and creating a data frame out of it. And I'm just using as data frame the R command. What you're getting from here is R data frame, unlike the R object that used to get. In this case, Mathematica actually knows what type of data it is. So it has an R data frame, and it has the R factor, which represents this, you know, the uh, meta information associated with this particular data. Also, the table form, <coughs> excuse me, understand the, uh, R state, the R data frame. So when you just do the table form of this R data frame, it actually puts this, you know, the column and the labels and the row labels in appropriate place like this. Also, you can use our filtering functionality just like this. So I want to filter out any data which is, has a height value greater than 78, and you can create a subdata, which is also written as a data frame, and you can actually confirm that data. And I will show you then at the end uh, how to use this combining with the manipulate to a uh, lot of interesting thing. And then, so this is how you get, oh, it's the same invasion, so let's go over. Now, <clears throat> sometimes the, the, uh, one of the actually compelling point of using R with the Mathematica is Mathematica can provide a lot of different type of visualization. I mean, R also have its own packages, but I believe Mathematica has more than what R can provide. And also R's functionality, I mean, the Mathematica's functionality, especially in the visualization, which I, I, I think that later on, Brad will talk a little bit more about that contains a lot of specified functions that you couldn't find in the R. So, but this is a kind of odd case. There are like, you know, number one or two functions that function, the visualization function that Mathematica is not, uh, doesn't have yet. I mean, I, I said yet because we will probably have it in the future. So in this case, it's a one way to communicate 
the create the graphics in the R and grab that visualization to the mathematical side. And in this case, we are using a PDF format as an intermediate format. And uh, we choose the PDF because it's uh, more universal in uh, all the platforms. So it, this function is just a, do, uh, not dummy function, but kind of meta function, which you pass the plot and the file name, and then it'll create a, uh, a output of that particular plot and save it as a PDF file. And this is a wrapper, uh, wrapper function on top of that. We use it our temporary directory and create a temporary PDF file and call whatever you know, our plot function there is and grab that. And how, let's see how it works. So in this case, instead of assigning any particular function, I just uh, directly send it. So the x-axis consists of a number 1 to 10 in point 0.1 increment. And then the y-axis is just uh, you know, assign values of that. I create a, a function plot of also association of those two. And you can see, you can directly get the answer from the R just like that. But of course, you know, as a mathematical user, you know that you know mathematical analysis is much more preferable here. Now, this is one of those examples that mathematical doesn't really have as a built-in function, hierarchical clustering function. I believe we do actually have a standard the uh, package for that, but uh, it's just data package. So, I mean, it's a showcase. So we create a random variable. It's a nice showcase to how you're going to combine mathematical statistics functionality, especially the things around the random variables. We have a very extensive list of the random variables and distribution we support. Using that, you create a list of random variables assigned to the uh, uh, y, the uh, values in R, and you evaluate. This one is just adding a label to those particular data sets. So it's just adding the uh, proper attribute to that, the object. Now I evaluate and create a correlation and the distant matrix out of this, which is done in here. And using the hierarchical the clustering function in R to create a plot function. So I draw two plot functions, then you can see that it was make a nicely graph the answer from that. Now the last example is how you're gonna use it. This is a very compelling example because I think it's a pretty strong point here. Uh, I'll provide also, you know, the way to create your own, you know, graphical user interface and such. But you know that Mathematica is a really simple way to create these lot of interfaces, such as manipulate. It's just uh, too easy to pass. So you know, it's a way to combining the uh, Mathematica's functionality with the R functionality, and you know, completely seamlessly using these two work together. So this is a uh, uh, our developer Leonid uh, grabbed uh, information from the uh, Stack Exchange. This is the uh, stati statistics on the uh, better sites on the Stack Exchange. And I will describe what all these numbers mean. And here, I create a temporary directory to store that particular data. I mean, I could have just send it to the R, but to make it a little bit interesting, I send it as a data, you know, the uh, file, and pass the file name to the R, and using R's function read.table to read up that particular, you know, the table, and associate a names, the uh, column names to the particular data set. So first column is name of site, Second column is a question per day, and question answered. A ABD users they have uh, this metric to measure how the you know the active the users are, and the answer ratio, and the per digit the day, the digit per day information. We associate that here. Now, let's see in nice form how it looks like. And I use the head command in R to show just a first bunch. It's not showing all data. Now. I create a filter function in R. I mean, you can, of course, do it in Mathematica. Just to make it interesting, I want to do it in you know, the, uh, the R. So I'm passing criterion, like a variable, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So order, the order by, and the each criterion, or what, what kind of filtering I want to do in each area, like a question, the query for day, a bit of users, and the answers, and such. I create that function. and store the assigned reference to the function to this particular Mathematica function. Now, this is all you, it takes. You call this function using these different variables, and you create interface. You know, the, uh, if you're familiar with manipulate, you know what it means. So the range and the initial values, and boom. What's happening is you just create a nice interface on top of the R function. You can, you know, choose to sort by all different, you know, the uh, areas. You can filter data by the uh, particular value, like this, and as you can see, What's happening here is whenever you change these values, Mathematica instantly calls R in the behind and to get the variable and displays on the Mathematica side. So as you can see, this, this provides a lot of good functionality <coughs> to Mathematica users. So for the Mathematica user, it's like a, you know, you're getting a lot of help from the R when you find your relevant function in R. Also for the R users, it provides a, a 
not just gluing language like uh, any other language like a Python, which, which doesn't have anything except just doing the gluing of other languages. It provides a lot of different functionality like a dynamic interface, you know, the graphics and the uh, connectivity to other languages and the database and such, and the easy way to grab that data. So it's kind of providing an army of functions to the R, and you know, it, it'll make your, you know, the work more productive in, in this sense. So. That's about it. All right. If you want to learn more about our link or find some examples or sample code, head to the Documentation Center. You can also head to wolfram.com slash Mathematica. One more presentation to get to, and that comes from Brett. And Brett, in version 9, uh, many new features that allow Mathematica, Mathematica users to visualize their data in brand new ways. Yes. So the three that we're going to talk about today are the new built-in legends, the unit integration into the visualization functions, and also the new gauges. So we're going to start with the legends. And the main things that I want to focus on for the legends are the built-in automation that we've added for them, their customizability, and the ability to use the legends in scenarios that aren't limited to just graphics, the ability to add them to pretty much anything. So we'll start out by looking at some of the automation. Um, so here we're going to define a data set for a bunch of curves, and we're going to create a list line plot out of that. And we're going to make the curves nice and thick, and we're going to assign labels for each of our four curves, and not very creative labels, but descriptive. Um, so here we go, and we can see that we have our legend over here on the right, and it has picked up the styles for each of our curves. So our fourth curve is a nice dark green, and we've picked up that, that color and that thickness, um, and didn't really have to do anything special for that. Next, we're going to look at list plot. Um, this is just a sample of some of our functions and the built-in automation. Um, so here we have four data sets that are sort of clustered in different regions. And for this one, we're using plot legends goes to automatic, which is going to create sort of placeholder position, um, placeholder text for us. Um, and I can select one of these and start typing. And then I can hit the tab key on my keyboard and move to the next one and easily navigate through all of my legend positions and fill them in manually that way. Also, I want to point out that on my plot, I said that I wanted the plot markers to be automatic, and so it's using distinct shapes for all of the different data sets in addition to the distinct colors. And the legend is picking up those shapes as well as the styles. Accidentally evaluated that twice, but there we go. So now we're going to look at plot. And the main feature that we're going to look at here is the addition of a special value for plot legends, which is called expressions, in which case the legend is going to look at the functions that were passed into plot and automatically create the legend text from that using the mathematical tr traditional form of those functions. Looking at density plots, we have our function, and we're creating a density plot from it. We're using color function to show to customize the colors and the styles for this. And with a simple plot legends goes to automatic, we're going to automatically create a legend that uses that color function and which has the range correctly go from minus one to one, as is the case for this function. And so if I, say, put a 2 in front of here to change the range, then the legend is going to update accordingly from minus 2 to 2. Let's see. I'm going to go ahead and increase my magnification a little bit. Um, and the last bit of automation I want to bring up right now is contour plot. So I'm using the same function and color function as for my density plot example, 
But contour plot, of course, is not going to create a smooth gradient of colors. It's going to segment them and use a band of red and a band of orange and this sort of thing. And so the resulting legend for that shows us that what the segmented colors are, and it labels some of the um, values between them. It's not showing necessarily all of them. It depends on how many contours there are. When you have a lot of contours, it will filter some of them out to keep this legend from becoming too dense. If you have fewer contours, it'll label all the values. But I can look and see that between the value between orange and red is 0 0.8. <clears throat> and contour plot conveniently has tooltips on all the contours by default. And so if I mouse over the contour for one of the contours between an orange and red region, then I can see that that's also 0.8. So now we're going to look at the customization capabilities of the new legends. The customization is sort of based around specific legend constructors. And the four that we have right now are point legend, which is what we were seeing for list plot, line legend, which is what we were seeing for plot or list line plot, uh, swatch legend, which I haven't shown yet. It's what a lot of the charting functions tend to use, bar charts, that sort of thing. And bar legend, which is what we're using for color functions for both the continuous and discretized versions for density and contour plots. So the syntax for these is, for point legend, line legend, and swatch legend is some sort of style specification and what the labels are. And then they take additional options. In this case, I'm saying that the layout, I want to be in sort of a row so that it's a horizontal form uh, for all of them. And we can see our point legend and our line legend and our swatch legend. And then our bar legend in the continuous case <clears throat> at the end. So the automation goes beyond that. I mean, so, so those functions provide the basis for a lot of our automation. And those combine with a, a few additional wrappers such as placed. So I'm going to create my list line plot again, except that I'm going to use placed to position my labels below the, be below the plot instead of on the right-hand side. And the automation is such that it, when it moves the location, it automatically knows that this is probably going to be better as a horizontal layout, and so it's going to switch the layout as well when it moves the positioning. We also have some fairly flexible positioning. We can position the legend inside the graphic using a scaled coordinate system. So we're going to put it 4 fifths of the way to the right and 1 fifth the way up. So this is going to be in the bottom right corner. And again, we're just using the automatic labels. And they got cut off a little bit by the magnification. And I could still you know, come in here and type and tab between them and so on. We also have control for the size of our markers inside of a legend. So here we're going to use our um, plot example with the automatically generated text from the Mathematica formulas. And we're going to use legend marker size to bump up the width so that our line segments that are representational in the legend are wider and more visible. And so this is about twice as wide as it is by default. The legends also have a lot of built-in functionality for adding labels and controlling their styles. So here we're going to create our density plot. And on top of our bar legend, we're going to add a label for our legend. And we're going to control what the style for that is. And so now we see that we have our label at the top. And we've made all of the labels for the um, scale to be a nice, heavy, black, large font. And finally, we have a option, you know, functionality for exerting a lot of control over how things appear. Um, so here I'm going to specify a legend function, which is applied to the legend sort of as a wrapper. Um, so in this case, I'm going to give it a frame. And I'm going to specify a rounding radius so that the corners on that frame are sort of rounded off and not hard and square. 
Um, and also in this case, I've specified that I want the, I've specified all for the contours for this contour plot, and now we're picking up all of the contours and not just the automatically filtered ones. So now I'm going to go into an example where we are going to create a legend for something that is very much not um, a graphic. And so we're going to start by creating a table. And I've sort of demagnified this a little bit because the immediate contents of the table aren't particularly important. It's the numbers from 1 to 100. And all of the prime numbers I've highlighted in a large red font. Um, and, and so we're going to, and we've stored this into a variable called table. I love creative names. And, um, and we're going to build on that. So now we're going to create a legend that will go with this table. And I'm not using any of the legend constructors, any of the built-in ones. I'm going to do it completely freeform using column and some style wrappers and that sort of thing. Um, so here's my legend, and we have black font for the composite numbers and a large red font for the prime numbers. And now we're going to combine these in different ways. So the simplest way is to just use legended. And I say legended of my table and my legend, and then we get the final result, and it looks beautiful. Um, but what else can we do? So as we did with the plot legends option on the previous slide, we're going to use placed to move the legend. In this case, we've specified a very specific legend, and so we lose the automatic um, transition from a vertical to horizontal um, legend format. <clears throat> but also, we can still position the legend somewhere on top of the, gra on top of the object that is to be legended. Um, in this case, I've sort of toned down the table a little bit so that we can see the legend a bit more clearly. Imagine that, you know, for some reason your table had a bunch of empty space in this corner because, you know, you have long column labels on the left and row labels on the, um, oh, sorry, row labels on the left and column labels on the top, and so you have some empty white space in the top left corner. Um, and so then you can position your, le your legend there. So now we're going to move on to our unit integration for visualization. And this is basically going to fall into sort of three categories. The first is automatically detecting what units we have and visualizing them. The second is going to be using what we know about the units to create labels for axes and frames. And finally, we're going to discuss how to customize what units are used. Um, rather than whatever may be automatically detected. So here I'm going to create a data set. This will take just a moment. And I'm getting the, tem the temperature at the airport down the road for the month of November. And I happen to know that this is coming back in Celsius. And so we're wrapping it in quantity and we're getting some nice uh, temperatures in Celsius for November. Um, and now I just feed this into this line plot. and it plots the data automatically. Uh, so our maximum is near 15 Celsius, and the minimum was uh, minus 4 something. And we can see that off of the plot. Now I'm going to get the temperatures for December. And in this case, I'm getting them in um, Fahrenheit to get nice mixture of data to work with. And if I plot the combination of my November and December data, then it's going to, in this case, convert all of those Fahrenheit values into Celsius and plot the Celsius values. <clears throat> and we can see this by including the units on the as axis labels. And we just say axis label goes to automatic, and it's going to automatically put our label in the top left-hand corner here is deg degrees Celsius. And I can even mouse over, oh, mouse over it, and it has a little tooltip that gives it in a more explicit spelled out form. So we can also specify exactly what type of labels we want. So here's the same one. I'm going to say that I don't want any um, 
label on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, I want degrees Celsius, and I want the long form of it without a tooltip or anything. <clears throat> so then here we get the spelled out degrees Celsius as the label for our axis. And of course, we can do the same thing for um, frame labels, in this case, histogram, and it's choosing um, Fahrenheit as the um, units to use from that mixed data set. And I've turned the frame on, and we have Fahrenheit down here on the x-axis, which is the appropriate axis for histogram to show um, for the units. And so now the question is, you know, how do you control which units the plot is going to, the visualization is going to use? And the option for this is target units. By default, it's automatic. We've now seen this plot about three times. Um, and we can see that it's in Celsius. <clears throat> Instead, I can say, I can use target units to say that I want it to be in Fahrenheit. And here we get the Fahrenheit scale. Um, or I, mean, I can even use Kelvin's if I like, and you know, we get Kelvin. And so now we're going to move on to the gauges. We're going to take a quick look at the base set of functions that we have for gauges. We're going to look at how we can use the gauges as interactive controls for things and how to customize them. So the basic types of gauges that we have are angular gauge, which is sort of a circular speedometer sort of appearance. And then um, a vertical linear gauge, um, a horizontal linear gauge, and a classic thermometer type appearance. And for all of these, I'm showing the value 42, and that the range is going to go from 0 to 100. You can, of course, specify your own ranges. Um, and these all have little tooltips that additionally tell you what the value is. We also have some specialty gauges. Um, so we have an analog clock built in. And I've made the first argument here dynamic so that it's updating about once a second. Um, I see that it's about 107 champagne time. So I'll keep moving fairly quickly. Um, and the last one, the last specialty gauge that we have is bullet gauge. And this one takes a few more arguments than the other gauges. It's a little bit more complex. We have our primary value, which is 87. That's represented by this red bar here. <clears throat> we have some type of reference value, which is, in this case, 80. And that's represented by this gray marker, which we can see is at 80. <clears throat> and then we have our range with some intermediate points in it that are going to affect the gray shading. So it goes from 0 to 50 in sort of a darker gray, um, 50 to 75 in a medium gray and 75 to 100 in um, a lighter gray. And these are frequently used for monitoring, say, progress of some process against the previous incantation of that process. So sales this year versus sales last year. And the ranges might represent, you know, light gray means you know, sales in that range, and everybody's getting a nice bonus at the end of the year. Uh, sales in the darker gray region and people are perhaps working on their resumes. Um, and so that's an application, for example, of bullet gauges. Um, so now we'll take a quick look at how to use gauges as controls. Um, the simplest way is to just use it within manipulate. And so here I have manipulate, and I have a plot function that I want to plot, and I want to control the period on it. And so I'm setting this up as sort of a normal slider type syntax for my variable. And then at the end, I just drop in you know, a horizontal gauge in this case. And I'm creating a pure function out of it. And slot slot says that just provide, you know, take all of the option, you know, all of the arguments that it um, that slider would normally take. And I'm going to place this on the bottom. And the advantage of using a gauge as a dynamic control in this case instead of, say, slider, is that I get the values displayed directly on the scale. So I can see that I'm at 1, and I can move this up to 3 and see what period 3 looks like, um, and this sort of thing. And you can see as I move it along, my plot is updating nicely and smoothly, and um, it's kind of useful for that sort of thing. 
you can of course use um, gauges outside of manipulate um, using dynamic arguments. <clears throat> so here I'm creating a column and I have an angular gauge and I'm going to show some, show some labels on it. And this is tied to a dynamic variable x and I have that variable also hooked up to a slider and I have a button that will reset it to zero. And so here we can see the you know, finished product and as I move the needle by clicking it and dragging it, the slider is updating and as is the value down here in the value display. If I take the slider, the needle is going to update also and I can hit the button and reset everything back to zero. So the fun thing is that the gauges are not restricted to single values, so if I put a um, list of values in, so here I have two, var two dynamic variables, x and y, and I'm going to start one at zero, start the other at one, um, and I have two sliders and two reset buttons. We'll scroll that on screen, and so now I can drag the red one, and the first slider updates, and I can drag the blue one, which is tied to Y, and the second slider updates, and I can you know, sort of flip their order around so that what was zero is now one, and what was one is now zero, and I can hit my reset buttons, and um, they all sort of update back and forth any way that they sort of work. Um, and so finally, I'm going to look at a quick glance at the customization for gauges. Um, as an example, I'm going to set a whole bunch of different styles for controlling the frame on a gauge. Um, so I'm going to set the size, the thickness of the frame to 0.2. I'm going to set the element function to something customized. <clears throat> and I'm going to set the style for the frame to be green with no edge form. Um, and so we get sort of a nice green 3D looking sort of thing here. Um, I'll quickly show the update to the chart element schemes palette for gauges. So using, um, so we switch to the gauges tab and then we have our basic gauge types here. And then we have three choices that we can uh, select from. So we can choose what we want for the marker appearance for the needle. Um, and these tend to have various other controls that we can control different radiuses and what direction the light's coming from and that sort of thing. Um, we can also control the, f the face. And this is going to control basically the background for the gauge. Um, or we can look at the frame and control, you know. Um, so here we're going to look at that bezel sector that we were looking at and we can change sort of what fraction the inside slope versus the outside slope, that sort of thing. And of course we could insert the uh, final option setting and use that within our gauge. <clears throat> so the last two customizations I want to look at are the ability to specify scale ranges which will highlight along the axis. So here we've set everything to blue and we're using a light blue from 60 to 80, uh, sort of a medium blue from 80 to 90, and a dark blue from 90 to 100 and some built-in labeling for our gauges. So we've already seen when we were looking at some of the dynamic behaviors, the built-in, the ability to say gauge labels goes to automatic and have it display a numeric value in addition to the re uh, visual representation. We can also support units within gauges. And if I say full, then we'll get the numeric value and the unit, in this case inches, and I've also specified a freeform label for this example, which is height. And just wanted to point out, you know, sort of these all sort of position themselves nicely um, where there's a bit of space and in some traditional locations and that sort of thing. Um, and so that's the gauges. Certainly some fun ways to visualize data in Mathematica 9 and a few follow-up questions for you, Brad. Uh, let's go back to legends. Yeah, sure. How can I get the items in a legend to match the order of my data? Okay, so this is an excellent question. Um, so, and this is sort of, my first example is an excellent example of this. Um, so we have our curves and it sort of happens that 
the later data sets are larger than the earlier ones, and so the automatic legend um, layout is sort of backwards from the plot. Um, and, and so in this case, I'm going to go back to, say, my line legend wrapper. And I'm going to use the legend layout, uh, not legend label, legend layout. And I'm just going to say reversed and add a closing bracket. Um, and then that's going to flip the ordering of the legend so that it matches what my visualization is using. A very easy way to do that. And another quick question. Uh, how can I make the lines in a legend have the same dashing as my plot? This is another excellent question. Um, so currently the, um, I'm not sure if I can select into this to show this nicely, but basically there are several graphics in, say, this plot. Um, let's go down to the plot one. It'll be a little bit easier. Um, so if I say plot style goes to dashing of 0 0.05 and dashing of 0 0.01, and I put my option in the wrong spot. So we'll just move that over to the end. So we've got nice dashed curves, but they're not reflecting in the legend very well. Um, and, and the reason for this is that dashing by default is using a scaled coordinate system. And so the 5, in this case, is representing 5% of the width from the left end of this graphic to the right edge of this graphic. And it's doing the same thing for the little graphics that are building up the legend. It's just that they sort of get so small that they run together. Um, and, and so there are a couple ways of dealing with this. One is to use absolute sizes for the dashing. Um, so if I switch this to absolute dashing and say I want this to be five points or so, then we get our dash. Let's bump this up to about 10, and it'll be about what it was before. And we can see that that's reflected in that. Um, this is a case where you want, might want to also use legend marker size to make that line sample wider um, so that you can see more of the dashing pattern. Um, also, if you use, I believe, the named sizes, these also sort of go into an absolute mode. Um, and then that will also show up well in the legend. Great. And as always, if you want to find sample code or some examples to use for your new legends or your new gauges, head to the Documentation Center, find some guide pages there as well, or also check out wolfram.com mathematica.